Hi, I'm Mia Ree of Good Elephant Pottery, and this is my Deer Tail Brush, which is featured in my video titled Glaze Like a Pro. In that video, I talk about how I use this brush and why I depend on it so much. And once in a while, I get asked, where did you get that brush? And the answer is that I bought this from somebody who made it by hand. And that was all the way back in 2007. And that person has since passed away. So in other words, it's not always easy to find somebody who can make these brushes by hand. Now, like I said, this brush is quite old and there's still plenty of life left in it. But the truth is that these bristles have gotten a little bit thinner over time. It's a slow process, but it is happening. And that means that somewhere down the road, I'm gonna need to get a new one of these. So I decided that it was time for me to learn how to make these. And now I'm here to teach you how to make them too. These are the materials you'll need. And as you can see, you don't need much to do this project. You need a deer tail or deer tail pieces. And I will talk about where and how to buy these. You need something to act as a handle. And I'm using bamboo for this, which is naturally kind of perfect for this job because it's already hollow and it has a hole on the end. And I will also talk about where I bought this. And if you need to cut bamboo down to the right length, you're gonna need some kind of small saw, and I used a coping saw, but any small saw will work. And this is another idea for a handle that I think a lot of potters can relate to. This is a handle from a hole punching tool where the metal part has fallen out. So now I punch holes using that metal part all by itself, and this handle is just sitting around. And this will also make a perfect paintbrush handle because it's already hollowed out and it's got a hole on the end. And I bet a lot of potters out there also have these in their studio. You'll need some waxed dental floss, some E6000 glue, and E6000 comes in a few different packages. So if possible, get the one that has the pointy applicator tip. And this is not required, but it will make things a little easier. You need a pair of scissors, a scrap piece of cardboard, and a paper towel. This is what felt like the biggest obstacle to me when I decided I wanted to learn how to do this, and that is, where can I get a deer tail? And I had heard stories that people who make handmade brushes will pull over when they see a dead deer on the side of the road in order to get the hairs off of the tail. And I don't know if those stories are true or not, but I decided that that was a line that I couldn't cross. <laughs> but um, luckily it turns out I don't have to because fishermen use deer tail to make fishing lures and that's very common. And therefore hunting and fishing supply stores sell these. And if you don't have a hunting and fishing supply store near you, there are several of them that sell online, and that's where I got these. So even though artists call these deer tail brushes, the term that fishermen use for this material is bucktail. So when you're searching for this online, search for bucktail and bucktail pieces, and you will find these. And it turns out they're very inexpensive. This full deer tail was less than $10. And this package of pieces was about $2. And I would say that the full tail is more economical because you can get a lot more brushes out of this for the cost than you can out of these pieces. But um, if you only want to make one or two brushes, then the pieces make more sense. But again, since both of them were very inexpensive, it really doesn't matter which one you get. It's going to be cheap no matter what. Now, as for the bamboo, I bought this from a gardening supply source. And I used to use these in my veggie garden to make plant supports out of, and I haven't in many years, so these poles were just sitting in my garden shed for years, not being used. Until now, they're going to become paintbrushes. So if you don't have access to any bamboo poles, you can find them at gardening supply places. Now bamboo comes in a bunch of different sizes, so make sure you're buying some that is about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And like I said earlier, if you need to cut it down to the right length, you're gonna need a small saw of some kind. It's important to prepare your handle first because you need to know the diameter of the hole in your handle before you can decide how much hair is gonna go in this brush. The amount of hair is determined by the size of this hole. So I'm gonna leave this handle right here so that I can keep an eye on the size of that hole as I start to work with the hair. 
Okay, so but before I start to work with the hair, I'm going to cut myself two pieces of dental floss. And the first one is going to be about six inches long. And the second one is going to be about twice as long as the first one. All right, so I'm going to take this piece of deer tail and I'm going to section off an amount that I think is going to fit in that hole. And my advice to you at first is to grab more hair than you think you need, because when I tie this off with the dental floss, the diameter of this is going to get smaller compared to how it looks right now when I'm just holding it with my fingers. So I'm just eyeballing and sort of guessing at this point, I think this is the right amount. So I'm going to take my shorter piece of dental floss and tie it around this bundle of hair. And instead of doing a normal double knot, I'm gonna do a surgeon's knot, which is not that complicated. That just means I'm going to loop this end over once and then loop it around a second time before pulling this tight. And that second loop just means this first knot is gonna hold itself a lot more tightly as I do the second half of the double knot. And the second half of the double knot only needs to be looped through once. Okay, and that's a surgeon's knot. And this is the point where I'm gonna now compare this with the size of the hole in the brush and decide if I think that's the right size. And at this point, if you feel like your amount of hair is either too much or too little, you can cut off that first tie and either add or subtract hairs from this bundle and do that tie again. And just keep repeating until you think you have the right amount. But I think that looks right. You want this to fit snugly in here, but you don't want it to be so tight that you have trouble squeezing it in there. And you also want to have a little bit of space between the bristles and the handle so that you can get a generous amount of glue in there as well. But you don't want this to be so small in comparison to the hole that it's like rattling around in that space. But this looks to me like that's going to fit very comfortably. So now that we have this amount of hair measured and tied with one piece of floss, it is now safe to cut these hairs away from the hide. Now if we had tried to cut these hairs off before we had tied them with that piece of floss, these hairs would have gone flying all over the place. So that's why it's important to tie this first. But now that we have this separated from the rest of its piece, we can now tie this much tighter than what we did with that first tie. And that's what the second piece of floss is for. I'm gonna take the second piece of floss and start wrapping it around the cut end and I'm gonna pull it as tight as I can. And I'm gonna wrap it around at least six times, you know, probably more than that. Again, pulling as tight as I can as I go. And I'm gonna make sure that some of my wraps are overlapping some of my earlier wraps and that's just to help to keep everything tight. And again, the fact that this is waxed dental floss helps to keep everything tight. All right, and now that I feel like I've made a really, really secure tie, a really, really secure wrapping of floss here, I'm gonna take these two ends and tie another surgeon's knot. Okay, so I'm gonna loop this over once and then a second time and pull that first knot tight. And then the second half of the double knot can just be a single loop. Okay, so now we have another surgeon's knot there. So now all four of these pieces of floss, the, the leftover ends can be trimmed. And now I can do a test fit with my handle to see how it fits. Okay, that's good. Did you see how that went in? It goes in pretty easily. It's snug, but it still goes in easily, and that's a really good fit. 
And now it's time for the glue. I've got my scrap piece of cardboard and my paper towel. And this is just here in case I get any glue on my fingers. I have some place to wipe it off. So I'm gonna take my E6000 and squeeze out a little pile of glue. A generous amount. You don't wanna go skimpy on the glue. And now I'm gonna take my bundle of deer tails and I'm gonna start applying glue to the cut ends of this bundle. I wanna get a lot of glue covering all of those cut ends. And the glue is gonna keep this entire brush together for the long term. All right, so now that I've got the ends coated in glue, I'm gonna start coating the sides of these bristles with glue as well. And I'm gonna go all the way up until I've also covered the floss with glue. And I'm trying not to get it on my fingers, but that might not, that might not happen. <laughs> All right, so now that I've got, again, a generous amount of glue all over the cut ends and all the way up over the floss, now it's time to insert this into the handle. And once you've got this inside the handle, ooh, you wanna give it a few turns just to make sure there's a lot of good contact between the bristles and the glue and the inside of the handle and that the glue is evenly distributed. And this is why I said it's easier if you buy the tip that is really skinny, because the last step is to run another bead of glue around the entire base of where the bristles meet the handle. If you don't have this applicator tip on your glue, that's okay. Just um, squeeze out another little pile of glue onto your cardboard and use a toothpick to apply this bead of glue. So that's it as far as the work involved in making this brush. The only thing left to do is allow the glue to dry. It takes about 24 hours for this glue to fully dry. So what you need to do is find an object that allows you to dry the brush in the upright position. And that's because this glue is going to stay wet for a long time. So you can't dry it by lying it on its side because the glue is going to run off and it's gonna end up stuck to whatever it's sitting on. But if you dry it in the upright position, the glue has nothing to get stuck to. And if there's any amount of space left between the bristles and the inside of this handle, that glue is gonna end up running down into those spaces. And that's what we want. We want a generous amount of glue in between the bristles and the handle. So this is a brush that I made yesterday. So the glue is already dry and you can see just how strong this glue is. It's really, really strong. <laughs> and. Um, these deer tail hairs, even though they're really soft and they look delicate, these are actually really strong too. So this brush is gonna last a really long time. So the beauty of a deer tail brush is that not only are these bristles really long and really soft, but there's a lot of variation in length between all of these bristles. And that means that when you get the brush wet, this is just a little bit of glaze in this cup here. When the brush is wet, it forms a really nice point and it's the shape of this brush that allows it to make brush strokes that are really fluid and really pretty. I'm gonna show you some of the brush strokes you can make with these brushes. It's actually kind of easy to make beautiful brush strokes with these brushes, and it doesn't really matter what your experience level is. These brushes do a great job of making these really fluid and tapered brush strokes kind of all by themselves and that's because of the shape of these bristles when they're wet. And now I'm gonna show you what I like to do when I'm glazing my pottery. I like to take a brush full of glaze and fling the glaze through the air at my pottery. 
and it creates these splatter patterns that really convey a sense of activity and movement. So I hope that I have convinced you that making these brushes is really not very hard and that you will be making some of these for yourself sometime soon. Or maybe you're going to gather a group of your Potter friends together and have a brush making party because that sounds like that would be fun.